Thank you. Yeah, is it? Okay, there it goes. Okay, so here's lecture seven. Just going to review what I um, had said already just because I forgot to hit record. But basically, we're learning that we need to eat and we need to breathe. So we have to have fuel and we have to have oxygen. So cellular metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions that happen within the cell. And energy metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that deal with the conversion of energy from one form of a bond to another chemical bond. So we learned before that energy can change um, forms, but we can't create it. Um, and so it can just move from one form to another. And ATP is the energy that our body uses. Um, so we can start with, oh, you guys, I have this on the wrong thing. You can't even see it. Here we go. Now you can see it, sorry. Um, so with ATP, um, we can create energy by separating the second and the third phosphate. I think someone needs into the group. Hold on one second. Okay. Sorry, I had to let someone into the live discussion. Okay, so um, we can take ATP, break off the second and the third phosphate, right? And then we can create a lot of energy right here. Um, when we break off that um, P, or the phosphate, then we end up with adenosine diphosphate. But we can recharge this because ATP is like a rechargeable battery. We consume food that have phosphates in it and then we can create ATP again. So cellular respiration is the process of taking another form of chemical energy like glucose or fat and then converting that into the chemical energy of ATP. And every cell in our body um, is able to take the energy from the breakdown of carbohydrates and fats. Um, so cellular respiration, the body must have a regular supply of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins so that it can make the ATPs that we have to eat. So our body will always want to use carbohydrates first, then fats, and then proteins. Even though we can use proteins for fuel, it's not what they're designed to do. Proteins are designed to build up other structures um, and to create other proteins. Um, and so our body's always going to use the carbohydrates first just because there's certain um, structures in our body like tissues and organs and cells that require glucose for fuel. Um, and then if they don't have that, then our body would use fat. So if we're using protein, there's a breakdown in the system somewhere because, again, that's not what our body is designed to do. But we talked about macronutrients before. These are foods that we eat in large quantities. Um, and so basically those are our carbohydrates, fats, and our proteins. And we have to eat them in regular amounts, so tens to hundreds of grams, because we have to create all of this energy for a body to perform and have the energy that it needs to do all of its chemical and functional processes that happen. Um, so macronutrients can also be used for energy, but like protein, it can be, be used for building blocks in the body. So we eat the macronutrients, we break them down into a form of energy like glucose or fatty acids, and then we can take that energy and then we can um, create ATP and then we can break off the ADP and P and uh, create a lot of energy and then we can consume food again to recharge that like a rechargeable battery. So micronutrients, these are like our vitamins and minerals and we learned before that we consume these in smaller amounts. So this is like milligrams to micrograms. So if you remember, one milligram is equivalent to a thousand micrograms. So it takes even a bunch of smaller units like micrograms to make up one milligram. So they're very tiny units. Um, so all nutrients, micro and macro, must be brought first into the body. That is the step in nutrient processing, is bringing the food into the body, and that's the job of our digestive system. So we eat these large carbohydrates, right, but we have to break them down into something small like glucose, glucose for our body to use. Um, and macronutrients, we don't have to consume a lot of those because they are often stored in different parts of our body. Like iron can be stored in our liver, calcium can be stored in our bones. And so we wouldn't need to eat those in large quantities because they would actually become toxic since we do store them for later use. Um, so part of creating this energy is being able to get it into our bodies. And so we're going to talk about how that happens. So the term ingestion, this refers to eating. Um, so that's the 
physical process of, you know, chewing our food and putting it inside of our body. So digestion, this, this is where the digestive tract must break down food into small, smaller particles. So we learned before about um, polymers and monomers. We learned about anabolic and catabolic reactions, right? So breaking food down that's from a big structure to a small structure is a catabolic reaction. Um, and so for example, that's like taking carbohydrates and breaking it down into something smaller like glucose or taking fats that are big and breaking them down, down into fatty acids, which are smaller, or proteins that are big and amino acids, which are smaller. Um, and so um, after we break those smaller units down, they have to be absorbed into our body. So absorption is the step in the process, which is transferring those nutrients from our gut like our intestines, into the blood by moving them across the gastrointestinal tract mucosa into the blood vessels. So our GI tract, like our duodenum and our small other parts of our small intestine, um, they that's why those nutrients have to be broken down super small because in order for them to move from inside of the um, the the small intestines, they have to be able to pass through that mucosal lining. And so they have to be small in order to do that. Um, and after that, the body is going to distribute those nutrients that were absorbed. So that moves from the um, small intestines, and then it'll be absorbed through that. And then eventually, in, as it's going through, it enters into the bloodstream, and then it's going to go to the liver. So the liver helps to detox things in our body. Um, and the distribution part, this is done by our circulatory system. So the only process that um, our GI tract is responsible for is ingestion, right? The process of taking the food in. Digestion, where we have things like hydrochloric acids and a different um, enzymes that help to break food down from those big structures to those small structures. Once they're small, then we're going to go through absorption through the mucosal lining. All of that is the GI tract. But distribution is done through our circulatory system. And that's kind of like the highway that takes those nutrients to the different tissues all over our body. Um, so the steps of the nutrient processing, so cellular metabolism, after cells take up nutrients from the blood, the nutrients inside the cells are used for metabolic reactions. So it's used to make ATP or it's going to be used to make new building blocks in the body. Anytime we create something or we perform some sort of a chemical reaction inside of our body, there's always a little bit of waste left over, kind of like you're if you're frying bacon, right, and you're cooking it in the pan, you're going to get some amazing bacon, but leftover, you're going to have that nasty grease, right, and you have to get rid of the grease. And so that's kind of the same thing in our body. When we're creating certain things and we're performing certain chemical reactions, there's a byproduct or a leftover uh, pro uh, substance that has to be cleaned out of the body. Like we know that we're not supposed to have carbon dioxide or excuse me, carbon, yeah, carbon dioxide in our body, right? We have to get rid of carbon dioxide. We know that we have waste in our body because we have to eliminate that waste either by voiding, um, so urinating or defecating, right? Having a bowel movement. That's how we get rid of waste in our body. So this waste elimination, most metabolic reactions will yield some kind of a waste product such as CO2 gas from glucose or fat metabolism or ammonia from protein metabolism. So you've heard me say a few times that we, we do not use protein for fuel because it's a dirty fuel. And it's dirty because it creates ammonia. And ammonia is toxic to our bodies. And it can't be excreted on its own. It, um, we have to convert that ammonia into something else in order for our body to, to get rid of the ammonia. So the CO2 is going to be eliminated through our respiratory tract, right? We learned about um, the alveoli. And through uh, simple diffusion, we can have the movement of oxygen and CO2 from the red blood cells, um, depending on the concentration where that's at. Um, and so we can get rid of the CO2 by breathing it out. So the red blood cells carry oxygen, but they also carry that CO2 to the lungs so that we can get rid of it. 
Um, ammonia is turned into urea. Okay, so remember, you can't get rid of ammonia as is. It has to go through a process to get rid of it. It has to be turned into urea, and this is eliminated by the kidneys. So that puts a lot of work on our kidneys because it's having to do extra work to get rid of another chemical outside of the body. Okay, so cellular respiration of macronutrients. When the body has a choice of which nutrients to use for energy first, it will always prefer carbohydrates. Thus, glucose is the preferred fuel for our cells. Um, so burning or combustion. Anytime you hear that you're burning or you have combustion, it's going to require some form of oxygen. Because if I had a candle right? And I were to light it. And then if I were to put a lid over it, what's going to happen to my flame? You guys can speak up. It'll go out. It'll go out, right? Because it doesn't have any oxygen, right? We can't burn anything without the presence of oxygen. Okay. So anytime you hear we're burning calories or combustion, you know that it's using oxygen. It requires oxygen. Um, if there's no oxygen, then the burning is going to be impossible. So I'm just checking my notes, make sure I covered everything. Hold on one second. Okay. So before we go to the next slide, we have practice questions on page six. So number one says, which of the following steps in the nutri nutrient processing is not completed by the digestive system? So we're looking for the false statement. So does the digestive system do absorption? Yes, that's part of the function. What about digestion? Yes, digestion is part of um, the nutrient processing um, by the GI system. What about distribution? No, remember distribution is part of the circulatory system because it's in the blood and now the blood needs to carry those nutrients to the different tissues of the body. So absorption, digestion, and elimination, those are all part of the digestive system, but distribution is going to be part of the circulatory system. Um, combustion reactions involve, um, and that should be, B, reaction of molecules that happen with oxygen, because we talked about how if you hear the term burning or if you hear the term combustion, you must have oxygen for that to happen. When a cell has a choice to use protein, fat, glucose for a fuel, the cell prefers, we just talked about that, it's going to prefer to use glucose first. Um, which of the following is considered a micronutrient? So um, is carbohydrates a micronutrient? No, nope, that's a macronutrient. What about protein? Nope, that's a macronutrient as well. And what about lipids? Lipids is also considered a macronutrient. So vitamins, those are what's considered a micronutrient. So vitamins and minerals, those are our micronutrients. Uh, using foods to produce ATPs inside tissues is referred to as, and the answer should be A, cellular respiration. Okay, so cellular respiration, it goes through three major chemical reactions. And we're gonna learn about these different chemical reactions. The first one is glycolysis. Um, and then there's a step in between there called the intermediate step. And then two, we go through the Krebs cycle. And three, we go through the electron transport chain, or you'll hear us refer to the electron transport chain also as the, oops. as the ETC, you'll hear us call it the ETC in this lecture. All right, so glycolysis, okay? There's a lot of terms that we're gonna learn about that have glyco in it. Uh, so glyco um, is referring to the glucose, right? And the term lysis means to split or break apart. Uh, so one glucose molecule is split in half to create two pyruvates. Um, so this process takes about 10 chemical reactions which are completely reversible. So gly glycolysis is completely reversible. That means we can 
we can take the glucose and convert it to pyruvate, or we can take two pyruvate and create a glucose. And this is gonna make sense in a minute, because you're probably like, oh my gosh, I'm already lost. <laughs> Okay, the glucose molecule is a six carbon molecule, which we draw like this. So they're just saying that you have six carbons that are like this. After 10 reactions, you end up with, remember we talked about splitting this, right, in half. That's what uh, glycolysis is, is splitting it in half. Um, and then now you end up with two pyruvate, right? So one pyruvate here and two pyruvate here the second pyruvate, not two pyruvate. There's one pyruvate here, one here. So you have a total of two. So these two ATP molecules are produced during this 10 reaction process, okay? So the what you wanna remember too with glycolysis is that it's totally reversible, meaning that I can, uh, let me get out of here so I can go to my, um, my, my uh, whiteboard over here. My screen still shows the number five and six cellular metabolism and waste elimination. Uh huh. Is that what it's still showing? No, I have to um, switch screens so that oh, you guys can okay. see what, I, what I'm looking at. <laughs> Sorry. I have to change my view and it takes a minute for me to get there to do it. You stop sharing because I have to share my new screen. Okay, so do you see the whiteboard now? Yes. yes. Okay, so remember it talked about a six carbon that is a glucose molecule. Okay. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. When we do glycolysis, glycolysis is taking and splitting the six carbon chain into two, three carbon chains. By doing that, we change this glucose molecule now into a uh, two pyruvate. So pyruvates are a three carbon chain. So now we have a py Ruvate here. We have a pyruvate here. Okay. The process of taking that uh, one glucose molecule that is made up of six carbon and changing it into two pyruvates at the end, you're going to end up creating two ATP. You're going to get one from here and one from here. So total combined is two ATP. So it's kind of like you have two columns of things happening side by side because we split the we split this in half, and so now there's two things happening side by side because we have one pyruvate here that's going to go through chemical reaction, and then we have another one here that's going to go through a chemical reaction. So the process of taking a six carbon chain glucose, changing it into a pyruvate, that is glycolysis. That's what that is, taking that six carbon chain glucose and changing it to two pyruvates. That's what glycolysis is. That's what I want you to know. <clears throat> okay. And we also are going to um, learn that we can also, we can go this direction where we take the six carbon chain glucose and we create two pyruvates, but I can also take I can also take these together, these two pyruvates, and I can also make a glucose. So when they say it's irre when they say it's reversible, that means you, you could start with a glucose and then get two pyruvates, or you can take two pyruvates and you can make a glucose. That's what they mean by reversible. Okay, 
Do you guys see your slide again? Yes. Okay. All right. So what you want to remember with glycolysis is that it's totally reversible, right? And remember I told you reversible means that you can take one glucose and you can make two pyruvates or you can take two pyruvates and you can make a glucose. That's what they're talking about when they say it's reversible. You also need to know that this reaction is happening in the cytoplasm. So remember um, the liquid that's found inside of the cell where chemical, it serves as a chemical medium for reactions. That's where this is happening is in that cytoplasm. The process of taking a glucose and converting it to two pyruvates creates two ATP. Remember ATP is the energy that our body and our cells use and it does not require oxygen to do this. Okay, so glycolysis is what we call anaerobic because it doesn't require oxygen for that to happen, okay? It's an anaerobic, it does not require oxygen. All right, so we also learned that glycolysis is the first step in cellular respiration. All right. Any questions so far? So right now, I don't want you to look at this because I, this is gonna be overwhelming for you to look at. Don't look at that right now, okay? Just listen to the words and try to understand it by description as simple as I'm telling it. Just keep it at that. Don't get over uh, anxious and it's to the point where you're like, I'm never going to be able to remember this, that you can't even hear what I'm saying because I've been in that situation where the teacher is saying something and it looks so complicated that I just put a little wall up, my wall of anxiety, and then I can't hear anything else the teacher is saying because I'm so stressed because it just looks so complicated. Just right now, keep it as simple as I'm telling you right now. One glucose molecule, which is six carbons, is going to make two pyruvates. And remember, each pyruvate is a three-carbon chain. It's reversible. I can take two pyruvates and go to glucose, or I can take glucose and make two pyruvates. It occurs in the cytoplasm. It makes two ATP, and it does not require oxygen. That's all you have to know right now, okay? All right, there's a step that happens um after we that one more time what was that can you repeat that process one more time um and I, we're going to be going through that same process over and over and over again but basically i'm saying you take this six carbon chain which is a glucose and then you create two pyruvate there's one pyruvate here and there's one pyruvate right here and that's a three carbon chain so a pyruvate has to have three carbons because that's what it's made up of so you took one glucose molecule that has six carbons, and then you created two different molecules that are three carbons each, and, that, and those are called pyruvates. All right, so the intermediate step which occurs between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle is irreversible. So once we add oxygen, it's not going to be reversible anymore. So if we go from the glucose to the pyruvate, we can take the pyruvate and go back to the glucose. But once we add this oxygen in, we can't go back anymore. Okay, it's a done deal. Can't, can't go back. All right, so we have this oxygen, we add it in. The process of adding the oxygen is called the um, intermediate step, okay? So the intermediate step, all of the, the reason we have the intermediate step is we add oxygen here. And the reason we're adding an oxygen is so, do you see this little line? Hold on, let me take this off really quick. Do you see this little line right here that's broke off? What they're trying to do is take this carbon and this oxygen and they're creating CO2 because we wanna have only two carbons left. That's the purpose of the intermediate step. We're going to add oxygen here so that we can take one of these carbons right here, make CO2, because we want to only have two carbon chain left. Because this two carbon chain 
is called an acetyl group. We're going to talk about that in a minute, okay? What you need to know it, from the intermediate step is that its job is to add oxygen so that we can change the pyruvate into an acetyl group. And when we do that, we take one of those carbons of the pyruvate and add it with oxygen. We create CO2. And then now we only have these two carbon chains here and here. So we end up with two acetyl groups. Okay. Now it's irreversible because it requires oxygen, right? So the intermediate step is irreversible. You cannot go backwards now. Um, so this process occurs in the mitochondria um, membrane and the cytoplasm. Okay, so remember, we started with a six carbon chain. What's this six carbon chain called? Glucose. Glucose. This is glucose, right? Then we're going to cut this in half. Oop, what the heck happened there? Then we're going to cut this in, in half, right? So now this is going to come down here, and we're going to have two three carbon chains. What do we call these three carbon chains? Pyruvate. 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 When I took this glucose and I made these pyruvates here, I made one ATP here and I made one ATP here. So I made the total. If I were to add these, if I were to add these two together, right, I have a total of two ATP, correct? Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to add some oxygen here. This is going to keep coming down, but this is going to split here. This one is going to move over here. So now I have CO2. Same thing over here. Going to add oxygen over here. And then that's going to get rid of this. It's going to come over here. We're going to create CO2. So we have CO2 over here and CO2 over here. This is going to come down. And then these two carbon right here are now called what? Acetyl group. An acetyl group. OK. So this process to here, this is called glycolysis. Right, the, the darn uh, walkie has to be somewhere. So the process of taking the one, the one glucose molecule and converting it into pyruvate, that process is called glycolysis. What do I call this process when I add the oxygen right here? What is that called? Is it the intermediate step? Yes. When you add oxygen, that's the intermediate step. Now that I've added oxygen, can I make glucose again? Can I take acetyl and make glucose again? No, the no. step is irreversible. Nope, because this is gone. I don't have another way to make a three carbon chain because I made CO2 and I'm going to breathe that away. So it's irreversible. I can't go that way. I can take this though, right? I can take two of these and I could make glucose. But once we add oxygen, it's irreversible. And that step is called the intermediate step. So if, you've, if you're if you at the intermediate step, you cannot go backwards toward glucose. The purpose of the intermediate step is to create these acetyl groups. 
because in order to continue to the next step of cellular respiration, I have to have an acetyl group because the next step is the Krebs cycle. And I have to have an acetyl group in order to put the through the Krebs cycle. I can't put pyruvate through the Krebs cycle. Okay, I have to convert it to acetyl. And by adding in oxygen, that's what I did. I got rid of one of those carbons and I created an do acetyl. Do we do a home care paper for C14? Yeah, she should have it in the phone. So someone has their microphone on, if you don't mind turning it off, because it's getting confusing to the students. Thank you. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that you're getting to the acetyl group to put that through the Krebs cycle. That's the whole purpose of the intermediate step, okay? Glycolysis, the purpose of it is to convert glucose to pyruvates, okay? That's what glycolysis is. The process of taking two pyruvates and making a glucose is called reverse glycolysis because we're going the opposite direction, which you'll learn later. But it, but when we have glycolysis, that is reversible. We can go either direction. But once you add oxygen, you can't go back. Adding oxygen is called the intermediate step, and its purpose is to get to the acetyl group. <clears throat> Sorry, I wish there was an easier way for me to switch between, but I can't, I can only draw my tablet, so I have to switch screens. Okay. So remember this step right here, right? This step to this step is called glycolysis. The step where I add the oxygen is called the intermediate step. Its purpose is to get rid of this C here and the C here, create CO2 so we can get rid of it from our lungs and we can end up with two carbons, which make an acetyl group. That's the whole purpose of the intermediate step because I have to have these acetyls to enter them into the Krebs cycle. So if you look right here, we're gonna go into the Krebs cycle here because now I have these acetyl groups, right? Okay, so each acetyl group, which is a two carbon chain, undergoes the Krebs cycle. It's a process of 12 chemical reactions. Um, these reactions yield two ATP, one from each Krebs cycle. So when we take this acetyl group and we put it into the Krebs cycle, this is gonna create one ATP on this side. And when we do it over here, it's gonna create one ATP on this side. So a t there's a total of two ATP, but each Krebs cycle is making one ATP. Does un everyone understand what I'm saying? Each, each Krebs cycle is going to make one ATP because there's two here. There's one here and there's two here, right? So there, there's two Krebs cycles, but each one makes one ATP. It's important for you guys to understand that terminology because some of the questions will trick you if you're not listening or not, lis not, not, not listening, but if you don't read it correctly or interpret what it's saying. If it's asking you the whole process, then it's then it's gonna give you two ATP. If it's asking you how many ATP is created in one Krebs cycle, then it's only one ATP, okay? <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna continue down the Krebs, because we went through the Krebs cycle, we created two ATP. We're going to take what's left over after the Krebs cycle and we're going to put it through the electron transport chain. Remember I told you you might hear it called the ETC, um, following the Krebs cycle. Um, so this requires oxygen. <clears throat> it takes place in the mitochondria. There are 17 ATPs per acetyl group. So two acetyl groups, um, and then there's a total of 34 um, ATPs once you go through the whole process of the um, cellular respiration. So I know that that sounds very wordy and very overwhelming really quick. So I'm going to kind of break it down for you here, okay? We started with our, um, our glucose molecule right here, okay? This is our six carbon. We went through glycolysis, right? Glycolysis was to split this in half, and then you ended up with two pyruvate. The process of doing that 
created two ATP. So glycolysis makes two ATP. And you're going to end up with two pyruvates. Okay. Then we're going to go through the intermediate step. Okay. Who remembers what the intermediate step is for? Why do, what's the intermediate step for? for you add the oxygen. We're adding oxygen. And what, what does adding the oxygen do? Gives us the acetyl groups. It gives us the acetyl group, right? Because we're going to get rid of this carbon right here. And then we'll end up with a two carbon, which is what we need to create the acetyl group. This oxygen is going to bind, right, with this carbon right here. So then we'll have CO2 that we can breathe out through our lungs later. <clears throat> okay. And then we can take this acetyl group now, these acetyls right here, and we can put them through the Krebs cycle. So remember when we put these acetyls through the Krebs cycle, we're going to make one ATP and another ATP. So both these Krebs cycles together, the whole thing creates two ATP. Okay. We're going to continue through to the ETC or the electron transport chain. This requires oxygen too. Okay. This requires oxygen. This requires oxygen. So even the Krebs cycle requires oxygen. This ETC is going to create 17 ATP. This ETC is going to create 17 ATP. So both of these <clears throat> ETCs together create a total of 34 ATPs. Does everyone, is everyone still following? <clears throat> Yes. All right, so let's do a little check just to make sure. How many ATP will, will uh, glycolysis create total? Two. 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 ATP will the Krebs cycle? Two. Two. And what about the ETC? 17. The total, remember Krebs cycle? 34. 34, okay. So, but if I said how many ATP is created in one ETC, you would then say 17. Or if I say one Krebs cycle, you would say one. If I, do you see what I'm saying? One pyruvate conversion of one pyruvate would be one. Um, so you have to listen to how the questions are worded for you to be able to um, answer it correctly, okay? So I know that it looks <clears throat> really intimidating, but I promise you, Dude, I don't know what's wrong with my voice. My allergies are so bad. Sorry. <clears throat> you need to know that taking this glucose mole molecule, converting it into these pyruvates right here, that process is called glycolysis. Can I take like can I take pyruvate and go back? Can I take two pyruvate and make a glucose molecule? No. I guess. Yes. 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 Yeah. I haven't added oxygen, right? So the process of, of taking a glucose molecule and creating two pyruvates, I can take two pyruvates and I can create a glucose molecule as long as we haven't added the oxygen yet, right? Once we enter into the um, intermediate phase, <clears throat> sorry, someone's trying to log in, um, then I have to, uh, then it, you can't go back. Once you enter the intermediate stage, stage, and that's because we've added oxygen, that's why you cannot reverse and go back the other direction. Okay, so glycolysis is reversible. The intermediate step is not reversible because we've added oxygen. Okay, and then the purpose of the intermediate step is so that we can get to this acetyl group. Oops, sorry guys. We can get to this acetyl group right here because we have to have an acetyl molecule to put inside this Krebs cycle, okay? The total, because this is happening on this side and this is happening on this side. So you have to listen to how the wording is created. If it says the, to the total Krebs cycle, then we're gonna say two ATP, or if it says each Krebs cycle, then we would say it makes one ATP, okay? Then you're gonna continue down here to the ETC and this has oxygen. And so then we're gonna create 17 ATP with each ETC or the total process from top to finish, it's going to yield um, with this group right here, 34 ATP. All right, so 
knowing that this can create two ATP, this can create two ATP, this can create 34 ATP. The total amount, if I start from the beginning process of cellular re respiration to the very end, we can make about 38 ATP total in the presence of oxygen, okay? So in the presence of oxygen, we can create a total of 38 ATP, right? We get two from glycolysis, we get two from the Krebs cycle, and we get 34 from the ETC, right? That's a total of 38. So you guys know where I'm getting it from, okay? All right, any questions so far on what I've gone over? It's a lot, but it's pretty easy. Yeah, I'm trying to break it down as simple as I can because there's a lot of wording, right? <laughs> there's a lot of words in here, so I'm trying to simplify what it needs to be. All right, so the reason why, oops, I'm not erasing. The reason, why is it not erasing? That's annoying. Um, the reason I'm going over all of this right now is because we're going to start talking about aerobic cellular respiration, which is what we're talking about now. So when you're working out, for let's say, for an example, you have to create energy for your body. And that's why we always check our pulse, right, when we're doing aerobic workouts, because we want to make sure we have enough oxygen. If our heart is beating too fast, then our cells are not going to get enough oxygen. They're going to be working under anaerobic conditions, which means that if I don't have oxygen, oh my goodness gracious, if I don't have oxygen, I can only go as far as glycolysis because this requires oxygen, this requires oxygen, this requires oxygen, right? So if I do not have oxygen because my heart is beating too fast or I'm sick for some reason with pneumonia and I can't take in enough oxygen, my body is going to perform in an aerobic, which means without oxygen, conditions. So the most I can make are two ATP compared to 38 ATP. That's why we feel tired and fatigued when we don't feel so well, especially if um, our oxygen is being affected. So we're going to talk a little bit more about anaerobic versus aerobic, but we have um, our practice questions first. Okay, so which of the following steps in respiration of glucose is irreversible? So which step is irreversible, meaning you can't go back? Is glycolysis reversible? D. D. Yep, the answer is D, but is, is glycolysis reversible? Yes. 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 yes, and pyru we can take pyruvates and make glucose, right? So yes, that's yes. reversible. And the production of glucose from pyruvate is reversible. So the answer is D. Okay, which of the following process in glucose respiration does not require oxygen? Glycolysis. A, glycolysis, good. And then at the end of glycolysis, one glucose molecule. So I forgot to, well, no, we did talk about that because the six carbon chain is one glucose molecule. Okay, so one glucose molecule, molecule at the end of glycolysis will create how many ATP? A, two ATP. A, two ATP, good. And then pyruvate is the product of? A, glycolysis. Glycolysis, good. Okay, so, um, Aerobic versus anaerobic. So in the presence of oxygen, one glucose molecule can be burned completely to yield 38 ATP. Just FYI, if you're a student and you're using like, and I do this sometimes too, like I'll have my computer up and then I'll have my phone up and I'm actually logged in to my, uh, my Google Meets on both. I have to mute one of them and I have to turn the volume off on one of them because otherwise it echoes. So if you're one of those people and you're hearing that echoing, that's why. So on one of your devices, if you turn the volume down and mute it, then you won't have that echo in your ear. Okay, so sometimes the tissue um, metabolic needs are very high. For example, during an unusual strenuous workout and then the body supply system, cardiovascular system, and the respiratory system cannot keep up with the oxygen demand. So in this situation, the cells are forced to use glucose to make ATP. 
Um, and so they have to do that without the presence of oxygen. Only glycolysis can be completed without oxygen, i.e. splitting the glucose in half and making pyruvates, yielding two ATP. So this is an anaerobic respiration because we don't have oxygen. So the Krebs cycle requires oxygen, the intermediate step requires oxygen, the ETC requires oxygen. So we can only go as far as glycolysis, which means we can only create those two ATPs. Um, so when glucose is used without oxygen, cellular respiration can go only as far as glycolysis, and the rest of the process cannot be completed. But what do you think we will do with these pyruvates? Okay, so if we're creating a bunch of pyruvates and we can't change them back into glucose, then they're going to be changed into something called lactic acid. So we can, remember the three carbon chains, those are pyruvates, but we can also take the pyruvates and create them into lactic acid. So like when you do an, a strenuous workout, you'll feel really sore the next couple days, right? And that's due to that lactic acid that was built up inside of your body from working in that strenuous workout. Um, and so we're going to learn about a process of taking these lactic acids and then what is that called? Um, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. So if oxygen is not available, then the pyruvate undergoes fermentation. So that's what the process is of creating that pyruvate into the lactic acid. So there's two types of fermentation. There's lactic acid fermentation, which happens in animals. So we're animals. And then also alcohol fermentation, right, which is where we create ethanol and CO2. And um, so like when we make beer and wine, things like that. Um, so remember, glycolysis can be completed without oxygen. It's the only one that's in the cellular respiration that um, we can put glucose through without oxygen um, to create ATP. Um, have you guys learned the term uh, gluconeogenesis yet? Have you heard that term? I don't recall. Okay. Okay. Um, so during an usual strenuous workout, the cardiovascular system cannot keep up with the oxygen to the muscle because it, it's not used to those higher level of exertion. So the muscles are then forced to switch to anaerobic metabolism resulting in the production of lactic acid. Note lactic acid accumulating in the muscle tissue is what causes soreness the next day. The soreness lasts until the lactic acid is gradually removed from the muscle by blood circulation and then it's taken to the liver, which takes about 24 to 48 hours following the workout. And then in the liver, it's then converted back into glucose. So we can take pyruvate and convert it into, into glucose. We can also take lactic acid and we can convert that back into glucose. So when lactate is recycled, so lactate is the same thing as lactic acid, that cycle is called a futile cycle where you're taking the, the lactic acid and you're converting it into glucose. And that process is done in the liver, but it's called a futile cycle. And you guys have that on page 13, if you want to um, look at that information. So remember, futile is the removal of lactic acid from the muscle um, by blood circulation, and then it's taken to the liver, it takes 24 to 48 hours, and then it can be converted back to uh, glucose. So if you look below that, remember I was telling you if you'd seen that word yet, it says this process of making glucose from something else is called gluconeogenesis. So do you guys know what the word genesis means? Anyone here know what the word genesis means? Doesn't it mean to create? It means creation, right? So like if you're a Bible scholar, genesis is all about the creation of the world. Like if, if you read the scriptures, right? But gluco means um, glucose and then neo meaning new and then genesis so creation of, of new glucose that's what the term means um, and so we're taking lactic acid and we're converting that into glucose that's gluconeogenesis or taking pyruvate and creating glucose 
that is also gluconeogenesis. It's taking something other than glucose and creating glucose from it so that we can use it as energy. Okay, so this is just a picture, and I think you guys have this picture too, but before we start going into this, I wanna go over our practice questions on page 14. So, does someone have a question? Sorry, no questions? Okay, so one, when animal cells do not receive adequate oxygen, they can use glucose anaerobically. Anaerobic respiration of glucose yields how many ATP? A2. A2, good. Okay, aerobic respiration of one glucose molecule can yield up to? Seventeen. So remember, it's one glucose molecule, and it's talking about going through the whole process. Thirty-eight. Eight. 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 Aerobic. That tells me I'm I have oxygen, right? So we can make a total of thirty-eight ATP. So that's a D. So you have to recognize the terms anaerobic, which means without oxygen, and aerobic, which means that you do have oxygen. So we have oxygen. We can go through all three steps. Um, anaerobic respiration of glucose in muscles results in the production of? The lactic acid. The lactic yeah. acid, good. And a byproduct of anaerobic respiration must be removed from cells, recycled, and turned back into glucose by the liver. This process is called? B, gluconeogenesis. Yes, B, gluconeogenesis, right? We're creating something... We're creating glucose from something other than glucose. Good. Okay, any questions before I continue on? You guys doing okay? I'm not going to give you a map and be like, label all of this. Um, I don't think the quiz has that on there. So futile cycle was the removal of lactate? lactate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so futile cycle is removing that lactate, and then they're taking the lactate, and they're creating glucose. So that's how we clean it out of our system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we have a carbohydrate, carbohydrate metabolism summary. So number one, so when we eat carbs, right? So that's where we're getting our glucose from, like uh, breads, rice, potatoes. We eat the starch. Then the starch is stored in your stomach and then it's slowly released into the small intestines. Do you remember what that process is called where we're eating carbs? Do you remember what the term was? We talked about it at the very beginning of the lecture. Ingestion? Yes, ingestion, right? We're taking the food in, okay? And then the starch is stored in your stomach then it's slowly released into the small intestines. And then the small intestines, the starch is digested, digested into glucose, right? So the digestion is taking those bigger molecules or those polymers. So you can see this is like a polymer right here, right? It's a big chain of something. And then we're breaking it down into something that's smaller. So you can see these single chains right here. So digestion occurred, right? We took that big molecule broke it down into something smaller specifically in this case they're talking about glucose okay so that's digestion and then now it's going through the stomach mucosal lining into the bloodstream so do you guys remember what that was called when it gets into the absorption description yeah, so absorption is taking those small molecules and putting it in good and then now that it's in the bloodstream what is that called distribution Distribution, good, yeah. So now we're taking all these nutrients, right? And we're distributing it to the different parts of our body, okay? And so this glucose is absorbed from the small intestine. Someone use their um, microphone for me, because there's echoing. Thank you. So the glucose is absorbed from the small intestine into the blood, and then, um, then the inhaled air brings oxygen into the lungs. Uh, which gets transported by the blood cells. And then there's an increase in the blood glucose, um, which causes the release of insulin. So um, our bodies, remember they like homeostasis, right? Um, and our bodies work kind of like the thermostat in our home. So 
if it's cold in my house, then my thermostat will turn on the heater to keep the house, um, it'll continue to heat the house until it reaches whatever I set it to be, maybe 68 degrees in the house, and it'll turn off, right? It doesn't keep heating up the house until it's like 100 degrees. It has a set point at which it's gonna turn off, okay? Same thing for my air condition. If it's too hot in my house, then it's gonna cool the house down to maybe 75, because that's where I set it, right, on my thermostat, but it's not gonna get 50 degrees in my house. It's not gonna keep, you know, continuing to put, to make the air cold in the house until it's that low. There's a set point, right, or homeostasis, right, of how I want the temperature in my house to be. So the same thing happens with our body. We have a normal set point for our blood sugar. So when our blood sugar rises above what that set point is, then we're going to secrete insulin. And then the insulin is going to tell, help take that glucose that's inside of our blood and pull it into the cell. And our body is only going to secrete enough insulin until that blood sugar falls between those normal ranges, which is like 80 to 120. Okay. And so, uh, it's not going to continue to put out insulin until our blood sugar is 30, which is way too low, right? It turns off when it falls in between those set points. So uh, that increase in the blood sugar is what's telling the body to secrete the insulin. Um, the insulin um, stimulates the membrane proteins to transport glucose into the cell by facilitated diffusion. So if you remember before, molecules that are too big or molecules that have a charge, they can't fit through that phospholipid bilayer. They have to use those special gates that are on the, the surface of the cell. So insulin, it, it um, attaches itself, because remember, it's like a lock and a key, right? The, the insulin has a specific shape, and so does the receptor on the cell, and they fit together. And then it turns on the reaction that allows the cell to take in the glucose through those gates because it's, it has a charge. And so that's what the job of insulin is, is so that we can move those polar molecules like glucose into the cell. So in the, inside the cell, the glucose meets with oxygen that it got from the lung and it gets burned for ATP and it turns into CO2 and water. So remember, we learned that when we add oxygen in the intermediate phase, we create CO2. Um, and we continue to create CO2 through that process. And so we have to get rid of it. We also create water. So the byproduct of aerobic cellular respiration, so in the presence of oxygen, the byproduct is water and it's also CO2, which is why we have to urinate too, because we're creating water um, when we're um, performing these chemical reactions. Um, and then the CO2 diffuses out of the cell into the blood, which carries it to the lungs. And so then we're able to exhale the CO2. All right, so you guys have practice questions on the bottom of 15. It says, what do you think will happen and how would this diagram change if glucose could, could not get into the cell? So because um, there's a lot of people, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read to you the answer that I wrote down and you can judge whether it's similar to yours. But normally glucose is released into the bloodstream. The rise in the blood glucose stimulates the pancreas to release insulin to allow glucose to enter the cells for energy. So cells could not perform their metabolic functions um, if they were unable to get the glucose inside the cell for energy. The cells would die and then high levels of glucose in the blood is gonna lead to damage. Um, so that high elevation in the blood glucose does a lot of damage to people. That's why um, people that have uncontrolled diabetes, um, they lose their limbs, they lose their eyesight, they have heart disease, they get neuropathy, right? So there's a lot of complications that can happen because they either don't have the insulin to take the glucose into the cells or their body can't work with the insulin that it has. So they have like an insulin resistance. Um, so uh, number two says, what do you think will happen and how would this diagram change if oxygen could not get into the cells? So remember, we have to have oxygen in order to burn glucose, okay? So without O2, we're gonna be working under anaerobic cellular respiration. And if you remember when we talked about anaerobic respiration, we're limited to the amount of ATP that we can create. We can only create two. 
and we make a bunch of pyruvates and our body can't keep up with converting the pyruvate back into glucose and so it's converted to lactic acid. So now we have this increase in lactic acid um, and our body has a specific pH. Um, we haven't really gotten into pH just yet, but when I'm talking about pH, I'm talking about whether it's acidic or whether it's basic or alkaline. So our blood is about um, 7.35 to 7.45. So we're slightly, I don't know, al alkaline, I guess. Um, and if we have a lot of lactic acid, that's actually gonna change the pH in our body. And then we could have something called metabolic acidosis. Um, and you've probably heard of the term diabetic keto acidosis, right? So that's what when people that have diabetes, they have chronic elevated sugars that are uncontrolled, they can have what's called diabetic ketoacidosis. All right, so any questions on those practice questions before we start on the next part of our lecture? And I think we're going to take a, like a little um, break unless everyone's okay to continue going without the break. Does anyone here need a break? Little break. All right. Little so let's, let's take like a, a five minute break. Okay. And then we'll come back. So come back at like 11 26.
All right, guys, is everyone back? Yes. All right. Okay. Do you guys still see the screen with the flowers on it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, do you guys see the introduction to body systems slide now? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Okay, so now we're going to go into the digestive system. So here we can see um, this is where our mouth begins. We have salivary glands inside of our mouth. So our salivary glands actually do secrete things like amylase, which help to break down starches. So digestion does happen partially in our mouth. Um, then it goes down, excuse me, the esophagus into the stomach. So the stomach is what holds our bolus of food. And then it's slowly dropped down into the duodenum right here. And this is our liver and this little green organ here is our gallbladder. So bile is made in the liver and then it goes into this little gallbladder right here where it's stored so that when we eat a fatty meal, it can release the bile into the duodenum as well. So it's kind of attached by a common bile duct into the duodenum right here or duodenum, however you want to say it. And then you have the smaller intestines here and then you have the small little appendage right here that's off the cecum. That's our appendix. And then this is our cecum, which is the beginning part of our colon. Then you have your ascending colon, your transverse colon, your descending colon. And if you look, this kind of looks like a little S right here. That's your sigmoid colon, and then your rectum, and then your anal sphincter, which is right here. Um, so sometimes you'll hear people refer to this as the hepatic flexure which is the bend right here. And hepatic, that means related to the liver. So this is closest to the liver, which is why they call it the hepatic. And then over here, they call this the splenic um, curvature right here, or flexure. Um, you'll have to know that for your anatomy class. Um, so um, the digestive system consists of two divisions. There's a gastrointestinal tract. And this is a continuous tube from the beginning of the mouth to the end of the anus. So this tube starts here, right? And it goes all the way through our system until it, ex it exits right here. Um, so accessory digestive organs. So this alimental canal or the gastrointestinal tract, all of that, that is the digestive system. But we have accessory organs that aid in digestion, like our liver and our gallbladder and our pancreas, all of those are considered accessory organs because they help in some way with digestion. So there's a difference between the GI tract and there's also a difference um, between the accessory digestive organs. Um, so the mouth or the buccal cavity is where digestion begins. So we take our food in right here. So I always like to joke with my kids um, or when I'm teaching and I'll ask people if they masticate and they're like, ew, no. And then I'm like, how do you eat your food? Oh, right. So mastication is the process of chewing your food. And then salivary glands, they provide saliva by secreting it into the oral cavities. And the saliva includes antibacterial enzymes and amylase. So remember I talked a little bit before about this amylase, right? How it helps to break down starches. It's, so it's the beginning process of breaking down carbohydrates. In fact, if you've had babies and if you've ever fed them out of the baby food jar and then you put the food in the jar back in the fridge, when you pull it out the next time, it's kind of watery a little bit. That's because the saliva that was dipped back into the food as you were feeding them from the spoon has partially digested the food. That's why we tell parents, you know, don't feed from the jar, take the food out um, of the jar, put it in a bowl and feed it from there because you don't want to give them partially digested food. They're not going to get as much nutrients from it and it can cause diarrhea. Um, peristalsis, this is the smooth muscle contraction of the GI tract that pushes the bolus down the tube. 
So after um, passing through the esophageal sphincter, so the food comes down through the esophagus right here, there's an esophageal sphincter. So it's easy for me to remember which sphincter is where because of how it connects. So the top of the stomach connects to the esophagus, so that's going to be the esophageal sphincter. And then it enters into the stomach where the food is continuously churned by strong contractions of the muscular organ. So the function of the stomach are to produce gastric juice, so it has hydrochloric acid, also mucus, so the the mucosal lining inside the gut has to have mucus to protect itself against the hydrochloric acid, otherwise it would start digesting itself. And then it has pepsin, which is a proteolytic enzyme, so it helps to break down protein. Well, our stomach is protein, right? It's made out of protein, so that's another reason why we have to have mucus, otherwise the pepsin would start digesting our own stomach. Um, and then it also has something called the intrinsic factor. So intrinsic factor is needed for individuals to absorb vitamin B12, okay? But be careful, there's not any absorption of food that happens in the stomach. The only thing the stomach does is digest food and it creates the intrinsic factor. The absorption of food doesn't happen until we start entering into the small intestines. So, um, it turns the food into smaller particles, mixing it with gastric juice, making it chyme. So those broken down food particles along with the hydrochloric acid that's or the gastric juice, that's what's called chyme. Um, and it stores a bolus or your meal, and it releases it drop by drop into the duodenum, which completes most of the digest digestion and absorption. So they're talking about in the duodenum. So this bottom sphincter right here is called the pyloric sphincter. Is, is chyme and bile the same? No, bile is, um, is secreted by the liver and it, it aids in fat digestion. But the bile does end up in our stomach because the common bile duct is attached to the duodenum. So if you're throwing up bile, it, that means it's coming back from the duodenum into the stomach. That's an abnormal finding. Okay. Um, only really throwing, yeah, you should only be throwing up really um, like hydrochloric acid or whatever content was in your stomach. So that's one of the things that we look for when we're assessing patients if they're vomiting. We'll ask them if it's bilious, right? If it looks green, because then that means that they are throwing up bile. So either they're having very forceful vomiting or there's something else kind of going on either with the liver or something to that effect. Um, so you guys have to know your sphincter. So this one on the top is the esophageal sphincter. And this one at the bottom is the pyloric sphincter. And remember in this area here, there is no absorption happening, only digestion. Okay. Absorption doesn't happen until we get into the duodenum down here. Okay. Only digestion is happening right here. And digestion can still occur in this duodenum as well, because that's where it gets access to the pancreatic enzymes that help break down different structures and also the bile that comes from the liver or the gallbladder. Okay, so here it's talking about the pyloric sphincter. That was the one that's at the bottom. It's a circular muscle that serves as a one-way door between the stomach and the small intestine. So things shouldn't come back into the stomach. Um, it's supposed to be a one-way door. Um, there is a condition in pediatric patients called pyloric stenosis, which means that there's a narrowing um, due to an increase of mus muscle in the stomach at the pyloric area. And then they'll have like this very forceful projectile vomiting. It's one of the most common uh, conditions that we see that requires surgery right after birth. Um, so that's usually where that happens. We'll talk about it again when you get into pediatrics. You don't have to know it for this class. Uh, the small intestines is is long, skinny tube that consists of three parts. There's the duodenum, some people call it the duodenum, and it completes most of the digestion and absorption of macronutrients. Okay, so you need to know what's being absorbed where. This is most, oops, this is mostly macronutrients right here. Um, and the duodenum receives secretions from the liver and the pancreas. Remember I was telling you the bile and also pancreatic enzymes. Um, 
accessory digestive organs. So liver and the pancreas, those are those accessory because they help with digestion and they provide secretions for normal macronutrient digestion and absorption. Also the jejunum, it continues to um, absorb food. And then the ileum, it continues, uh, there's a, a concluding part of the small intestines that completes the micronutrient absorption and it leads to the large intestines. Um, so let me see here. Sorry, I like visuals. You guys can still see me, right? I can't see you, but can you see me in a picture somewhere? Yeah. Okay. Just making sure I'm not showing a visual to myself. <laughs> That you guys can see it okay so we're going to talk about these intestinal walls and how they're lined and um, they have these this very wrinkly um tissue and on top of these wrinkles there's little tiny villi like little tiny finger projections that stick off of them and um, and so the purpose of them is to increase the surface area inside of the intestines which will allow for the food to slide over the intestines for a long period of time because there's more surface area and then that means greater absorption of nutrients. Um, so when people have conditions that affect their um, the mucosa inside their small intestines or affect those villi, like um, if you guys have ever heard of like celiac disease, right? So the Celiac disease, people have a gluten intolerance and it kills those little villi that live on the surface in the mucosa. And so then they have decreased absorption and they start having vitamin deficiencies and all kinds of stuff, okay? So um, here's a piece of paper, right? So the surface area for this is only this long, okay? But if I have little wrinkles, right, I can have greater surface area, right? This is like three times, and it's not even the full page with those wrinkles, right? So the food is moving across these little wrinkles this way. So it's allowing for more absorption. And then on top of these wrinkles are those little finger projectiles, right? So not only that, it's going through all of that as well, all those little wrinkles up and down. That food's moving across there. So it's allowing for a lot of absorption to occur, and that's its purpose. Okay, and I lost my pen. Oh, there it is. Okay, so the pancreas is an important accessory digestive organ because it secretes most of the digestive enzymes straight into the duodenum. So I talked a little bit about this before. This is the liver. The liver creates bile. Um, this is a common bile duct right here. And then this is the gallbladder. It connects to the common bile duct. And then this is the pancreatic duct. Okay, right here. And so both of these, the common bile duct, the pancreatic duct, they dump into the duodenum or duodenum right here with their enzymes. So bile helps to break down fat, but the, um, the pancreas secretes different enzymes that, sec that uh, help with lots of different macronutrients. Um, so we talked a little bit about exocrine glands a long time ago. So anytime I hear the word exo, I think of exit, meaning it has to exit through like a tube or an opening somewhere um, or a duct. Um, so this little tube right here, right, this is the pancreatic duct. So it's an exocrine gland. The pancreas is actually endocrine and exocrine, but today we're, right now we're talking about the exocrine functions. So amylase, um, this is a digestive enzyme that helps to break down amylose. So amylose are starches. And then lipase, I always remember, it, what, if it ends in ACE, that means it's an enzyme. And usually it'll tell you what it's digesting, right? Like amyl, right? Well, amylose or lipase breaks down lipids. Protease breaks down proteins. So you can kind of tell what an enzyme does based on the prefix of the enzyme. And you can tell it's an enzyme because it ends in ACE as well, like lactase. If you've ever heard of that for people that have an issue breaking down lactose. 
Okay, so exocrine, those are where um, hormones or secretions are secreted through a duct. But then endocrine glands, these are, these are hormones that are secreted directly into an internal environment like our blood. There's no ducts. Um, they secrete hormones. So like example, our thyroid gland is um, an endocrine gland. Our pancreas can be an endocrine gland as well because our pancreas is also responsible for insulin and glucagon. Those are endocrine functions of it. But because this is through a duct, these enzymes right here, it's also got exocrine functions, which is the amylase, lipase, and protease. Any questions on that before I move to the next slide? What, what page is that on? 18. If you look on the slides too, like I have the page numbers at the top. Can you see, you can see the slides, right? Is it, are you guys seeing them? Yes. Okay, just checking. Make sure you tell me if you can't see them. Um, so this is on page 18 where it's talking about this. All right, so um, we're gonna move to the next slide. So as an endocrine gland, the pancreas secretes two major hormones that regulate glucose levels. So the hormones that are endocrine are gonna regulate glucose levels, okay? So insulin, insulin is produced when glucose levels rise, right? So when my blood sugar goes high, that stimulates my pancreas to secrete insulin. And the insulin is gonna stimulate the cells to uptake the glucose from the blood and by doing so, right, we're taking it, here's my cell, right, if this is the blood and all the sugar's out here, and the insulin's telling the sugar to go inside the the cell, all the sugar that's outside of the cell is going to decrease because it's moving inside of the cell. Um, glucagon is produced when the glucose levels drop. So things like our brain, they have to have glucose in order to function. And so our body has to have a backup mechanism, which is why we store a little bit of fat and other products in our body. So that way, like when we're sleeping, right, or when we're at work and we can't get to the food right away, um, our body finds a way to create glucose from something other than glucose um, through gluconeogenesis so that our body and our brain can have the glucose it needs. So glucagon is going to be produced when those blood sugars drop below that normal range and it's going to stimulate um, our body to create glucose from something other than glucose until our blood sugars will rise back to that normal limit. So our pancreas has a lot of functions, right? It has exocrine functions, which is the um, digestive enzymes like amylase, lipase, and protease, but it's also an endocrine gland because it does secret, secrete things like insulin and glucagon directly into the bloodstream. Um, later, you'll learn that glucagon um, stimulates uh, us to break down glycogen inside of our skeletal muscles and also in our liver. So glycogen is stored glucose um, that's stored in our body. The glucose is stored as glycogen. So glucagon helps to break down that glycogen back into glucose so our body can use it. But you don't have to know that for this class or this lecture because we're going to talk about that later. Okay, so the liver. The liver has many important functions in the body, but the accessory digestive organ, it produces bile, which is necessary surfactant for lipid digestion. So bile has to do with breaking down fats because that's what lipids are. And bile is normally stored in the gallbladder, and from there, it's released into the bloodstream via the common bile duct. Then we have the digestive system, uh, the colon. Hold on one second. Okay, so the colon is a place where absorption of most of the water or electrolytes from chyme left, is left over and where it occurs. Um, it also harbors the normal gut flora, the good bacteria that produces vitamin K and biotin for us. 
um, while digestive fiber and other nutrients um, not digested by our small intestines. Um, so our it's important for you to know where things are being broken down in the different parts of our intestines. So we talked about like our duodenum, our jejunum, our ileum. Now we're talking about our colon. So when we talked about our colon, this is where most of our water and also our electrolytes are going to be um, absorbed. Also, we have our normal gut flora. So we have that good bacteria that's in there. Because remember, we talked about how we can't break down things like that have cellulose, right? We rely on that good bacteria. That's where that good bacteria lives. So we feed the bacteria, the cellulose, and then it creates things like vitamin K and biotin for us. And um, so vitamin K, do you guys, does anyone know why vitamin K is important? Why do we need vitamin K? Does anyone know what the function of vitamin K is? I forgot. You forgot? So vitamin K plays an important role for us to clot our blood. So we give vitamin K to babies when they're born because their gut is sterile, right? They've been inside mom, they've been in a sterile environment. When they're born, they don't have that good bacteria in their gut yet, so they don't have vitamin K. So they could bleed out from like their umbilical cord, all kinds of stuff. And so we give them a vitamin K shot to make sure that they have enough to help clot their body until their body can create their own natural flora. Um, so also Coumadin, right? We give Coumadin to patients as blood thinners. Um, because some people have had heart attacks or they have artificial valves or they have heart conditions that make them susceptible to developing clots. So we give them this Coumadin or the other term is warfarin to decrease the risks of their body forming these clots so they can bleed out very easily. So if they receive too much Coumadin, they can start bleeding. One of the antidotes for having too thin of blood is to give the patient vitamin K. Um, so biotin, ladies, we know what this biotin is for, right? It helps us with our hair and our nails and our skin. Um, so we like to have high levels of biotin um, to help us look pretty. Um, and also it helps us to digest the fiber because we can't do that on our own. And also other nutrients that are not digested in our small um, intestines. Um, so I, I kind of showed you a little bit about where things were, but I'm going to show you again. So this little appendage right here, this is the appendix, right? So um, everyone's heard of an appendicitis. They have to have their appendix removed. That's what it is, this little finger-like projection that hangs off of the cecum right here, right? And if we were to divide this into four, right, remember our four quadrants, uh, you can kind of see what part of the colon is where. When we auscultate, so auscultate is the fancy name for listening to bowel sounds, we start in the lower right quadrant because that's the beginning of the colon. We listen to the lower white right, right talking like a little kid, <laughs> white quadrant, I can't even talk. Anyway, start in the lower right quadrant, move to the upper right quadrant, right? And then we go from the right quadrant, upper right quadrant to the upper left quadrant. And then we listen from the upper left quadrant down to the lower left quadrant. We're following that natural pattern of the bowel so that we can see where the patient has hypo, meaning not very active bowel sounds, or hyper, meaning very active bowel sounds, or sometimes even absent bowel sounds. So this right here, this is our cecum. And then we have our ascending. This is our right hepatic flexure, right? Because our liver is over in this area. So that's where that term hepatic flexure comes from. Then our transverse colon. Then our left splenic flexure. And then right here where it looks like a little S, that's our sigmoid colon. And then this is the rectum. And then this is our anal sphincter where um, stool exits the body. So we have an internal sphincter inside of our anus and we have an external sphincter. The internal sphincter we cannot control, but we can control the outer sphincter. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because if we're putting in suppositories, we have to push the suppository past the internal sphincter, okay?
Can you, you guys see the Good video? grammar and spelling. Can you guys see that video? If you want to write essays that inspire, no. messages no. that forge bright no. It's the screen that says GI videos. You, you, and you don't see like a YouTube. Oh, you can't hear spelling. me when I do that. No. This is grammatically correct. No, we don't. Okay, hold on. Let me figure out why. The role and anatomy of the. Okay, let me switch screens. The role and anatomy of the pank. Okay, just curious. Do you guys see YouTube right now? Yes. 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 All right. Pancreas. The pancreas is an important organ in the digestive system. It is located in the upper abdomen, directly behind the stomach and next to the small intestine. In most adults, it is between 6 and 10 inches long and 2 inches wide. The pancreas is comprised primarily of a network of tubes or pancreatic ducts that release liquids into the upper portion of the small intestine, called the duodenum. Anatomically, the pancreas is divided into three regions, the head, the body, and the tail. The pancreas has two functions, endocrine and exocrine. Its endocrine function is to produce the chemicals or hormones that regulate blood sugar, such as insulin. Its exocrine function is to produce enzymes that help to digest food. Pancreatic amylase breaks down carbohydrates or starches into glucose. Proteases break down protein into amino acids, and lipases break down fat. Because these digestive enzymes are so powerful, they are wrapped in a protective layer while they are in the... If you guys, if your microphone's not muted, do you mind muting it? Because there's some echoing in the background. Thank you. Pancreas. To reach the gastrointestinal tract, the digestive enzymes travel through the pancreatic ducts and are eventually released into the duodenum at the major papilla, also known as the ampulla of Vader. Once they are completely out of the pancreas, the protective layer is removed and the enzymes become active. Bile from the gallbladder also enters the duodenum at the major papilla. Bile breaks apart fat into smaller fat droplets, which are easier for lipase to digest. When the pancreas is healthy, it contributes to a healthy digestive system. However, when our pancreas does not function correctly and is unwell, we can have trouble digesting food properly or maintaining our blood sugar in a healthy range. The consequences of an unwell pancreas may include diarrhea, bloating, flatulence, oily and foul-smelling stool, weight loss, malnutrition, poor blood sugar control, and diabetes. Heavy alcohol consumption, high-fat diets, Eating large meals, being overweight, and tobacco products can put stress on your pancreas, causing it to work less well. There are also some genetic conditions that affect the pancreas, notably cystic fibrosis. To help keep your pancreas healthy, eat a varied diet that is rich in fruits and vegetables. Include fish and white meats as favored sources of protein. Limit high-fat foods and alcohol to special occasions maintain a healthy weight, and watch your cholesterol and triglyceride levels. The gallbladder is located in the right upper abdomen underneath the liver just behind the rib cage on the right side. The liver 
produces bile, which is used to digest food. The bile is secreted down the bile ducts and stored in the gallbladder. Whenever you eat a meal, the gallbladder contracts and it pumps the bile down the bile duct into the intestine, where again, that bile is used to help digest foods, especially fatty foods. If you develop stones in the gallbladder, then one of those stones can roll into the neck of the gallbladder and obstruct it. Now, when you eat a meal, the gallbladder is trying to pump, but it's pumping against an obstruction. For that reason, it can't empty its bile, and that can cause severe pain in the right upper abdomen. The pain can also be in the uh, central upper abdomen, and the pain can radiate around to the back or shoulder blades uh, and can be associated with nausea or vomiting. Typically, you'll have that pain until the stone rolls out of the way back down into the gallbladder, and uh, once that happens, the gallbladder can empty. Because the stone can roll in and out of the neck of the gallbladder, the pain can come and go, and, and that's very classic and typical for gallbladder pain. The solution is to remove the entire gallbladder, stones and all, and what we do is place a clip across the cystic duct, which is the duct that connects the gallbladder to the common bile duct, and then we remove the gallbladder. This treatment is very effective at alleviating the symptoms of gallstones, and you can see that since the liver is the organ that makes the bile anyway, bile can still flow normally down the bile duct into the intestine for normal digestion after surgery. So this is just showing you what peristalsis is. You notice it's kind of like a rhythmic motion. I'll send that Krebs cycle to you just because um, it's a really long video. Okay. Okay, so you don't have to answer these out loud, okay? Um, but we're gonna go through these practice questions and then we'll do our, um, or my review questions and we'll do our practice questions for your chapter. Okay, so number one says, aerobic respiration of one glucose molecule can yield up to how many ATP? And the answer is 38 ATP. The following processes are performed inside the mitochondria. Um, so we learn like glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. Um, and the intermediate step occurs between the mitochondrial membrane and the cytoplasm. Uh, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain are happening in the mitochondria, which makes sense if you think about it because we call the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell, right? So that's where we're generating our energy. When glucose is metabolized aerobically, so aerobically means that we're using oxygen, it is utilized completely to turn into, so remember I talked about how anytime you perform a chemical 
reaction, there's going to be some sort of a byproduct le left over. So with aerobic cellular respiration, the byproduct is going to be carbon dioxide and water. Um, fermentation of plants, so that would be anaerobic. So fermentation of plants is anaerobically um, done, then that would lead to alcohol um, or in humans or animals, it would be lactic acid. Okay, which of the following does the pancreas secrete? So this can be a tricky question because remember the pancreas has endocrine functions and it also has exocrine functions. So that is your clue to answering that question. It's gonna be lipase, protease, amylase, glucagon, and insulin. So I always tell my students, always remember that your pancreas is responsible for five things, okay, five things. What organ secretes bile? And that is going to be your liver. So your pancreas secretes uh, amylase, lipase, protease, and then also glucagon and insulin. So anaerobic respiration of one glucose molecule can yield up to how many ATP? And the answer is to ATP. So your keyword here is anaerobic, which means we can only go through glycolysis and we have to stop because we don't have any oxygen. Anaerobic respiration stops at which label of cellular respiration? And I pretty much just gave you the, <laughs> the answer to that. But there's a lot of gluco words, right? There's uh, gluconeogenesis, glu glucogenesis, glucogenolysis. You're going to learn all kinds of fun stuff later with all the glyco words. Okay, which of the following is not a function of the stomach? So the answer is C, vitamin and mineral absorption. Now a lot of people will get confused on this one because I talked about the intrinsic factor which is made inside the stomach but the absorption doesn't happen in the stomach only the intrinsic factor is made in the stomach and it will travel through the stomach into the duodenum and then vitamin B can be absorbed but you have to have that intrinsic factor in order to absorb the vitamin B Okay, which one of which ones are steps that are in cellular aerobic respiration? So remember, aerobic means there's oxygen. So think about what steps you can go through if you have oxygen. So we can go through the Krebs cycle, we can go through glycolysis, and we can go through the electron transport chain. We can't do fermentation because that's without oxygen. Okay, ignore that and ignore that. All right, so um, I did like a math review uh, lecture. Um, are you guys still wanting me to do math with you guys? Or are you just going to use the, um, the video that I put up for you guys yesterday? I'm down to review it. OK. Sorry, I have to get the problems. Hold on one second. Did you go over the practice questions already? No, I didn't. Thank you for reminding me because I forgot. Okay, um, so the practice questions, number one, which of the following organs belong with the digestive system but is not part of the alimental canal? Um, and that's going to be number C, or not number, letter C. Um, number two says, which of the following is not a function of the stomach? And that would be E, digest and absorb most carbohydrates and fats. And then three says most water and electrolytes are absorbed in, and that would be the colon. 
Um, if you guys can make sure your mics are muted, please. Um, the bile necessary for digestion and absorption of lipids is produced by, and it's D, the liver. Sorry, I had to mute someone because I can't hear. All right, and then um, the next one says the bile necessary for digestion and absorption of lipids is produced by the D liver. And then the sphincter that controls the rate of passing of chyme from the stomach into the duodenum is called, <clears throat> that's B, pyloric sphincter. And then the role of the appendix in the digestive tract is none, doesn't really have any function. We don't even really need it. We don't even know what it's for. I guess at one point we needed it. <laughs> we don't need it any longer. <clears throat> so the role of the villi in the small intestines is A, to increase the surface area of the small intestines. Um, so if we can increase surface area, then we can increase the absorption. So that's what the villi is for. And the accessory digestive organs do not include, and it would be C, the kidneys. Yeah, trying to find. I don't know if your math problems were the same as the ones that I did, so I'm pulling them up really quick. All right, do you guys see my uh, whiteboard? No. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it might, be, it might be delayed just a little bit if you're just yeah. coming on. So if you don't see it, you might have to go back out and come back in because Okay, so the first, um, question for your homework says that the medication is infusing at 50 cc's an hour. How many cc's will infuse over the entire day? So you have to look at this problem and you're trying to figure out exactly what the important information is. Um, so it's asking us how many cc's are going to infuse over the entire day. Um, and if I know that they're getting a solution that's 50 cc's an hour, um, that gives me a clue as to how much the patient's going to get. So understanding what the infusion pump is set at and how long it's going to run for um, gives me a clue. So we're solving for cc's per day. So remember, whatever's in the numerator here has to be in the numerator here as far as units, so cc. So then I look at my problem and I say, well, what information is known to me that has cc's in it? Well, 50 cc's per hour. So when you have something like this, you have to keep that unit together. So basically, you can say 50 cc's in one hour, or you can say in one hour, the patient's going to get 50 cc's. You can set your, you can mix this around because it doesn't matter. It's equivalent to one but I have to keep those units together. Um, and I'm gonna flip them according to how I need them. I happen to need the CCs on top, so that's why I chose to use this one, okay? Now I know this has to be hours because I wanna be able to cancel these out. Um, so I have entire day, that's how long it's gonna run for, right? I have to get today, but this is hours. So I have to find a way to cancel that out. Well, I know there's 24 hours, 
in one day. Now I can just cancel these hours out. I Am I the only one who can't see the problems on the screen? You probably Does anyone else not even tag her other screen. She's got two screens, the one she's working on and the one that shows her. Yeah. I oh, OK. <laughs> so if you click on the if you click on my name, there should give you an option that looks like a little thumbtack. And you'll want to pick the one that um, is not the picture of me. It's the one that shows my whiteboard. And then if you pin it, it'll it'll make me just stick there. No, other people won't okay, copy. I see it now. OK. And then thank you. You're welcome. If you multiply this across, then you get CCs per day. And so that's your answer right there. All right, so I'm going to pull the next answer up. Or not answer, but question. Okay, so now we have a patient that's going to receive 1,680 mLs of tube feeding over the entire day. So they're getting 1,680 mLs over the entire day. What should be the infusion rate in mLs per hour? So it's already telling us basically what we're solving for. We're solving for mLs per hour. This right here is the same as saying 1,680 mLs per day, okay? So when I plug my information in here, I know this has to be mLs because it's what's in my numerator here. So don't pay too much attention about what's right here, okay? I don't want you to focus on that. We only care about what's in the numerator. That's the unit that has to be here because this is mLs per day. It's not mLs per hour, but it doesn't matter because it has mLs here and this is mLs here and that's what I want to start with. So 1,680 mLs per day. But I have to be able to get from day to hour. I know this needs to be a day. So what can I put right here to get to hour? 24. I'm going to put 24 right here. Am I putting 24 right here? One. Yeah, one. One, one day. And then what do I put down in this section? 24. 24 hours. Apple hours. hours. Yeah, good. Okay. And then now I can cancel out my day. And then I can multiply this across, right? So you would end up with 1,680 over 24. And then you end up with 70 mLs per, oops, hour. Okay. Sorry, my TA is texting me. I'm like, I'm in class. Stop bugging me. All right. Any questions on this one? Okay, so now we have a patient, they're getting an IV infusion, and they need to receive a total of 1,000 cc's for the whole day. Um, and the infusion rate is 50 cc's an hour. How many hours will it take to complete the infusion? So we want to know... Um, if the doctor prescribed that the patient was going to get that certain volume, and if we set the pump to run at 50 cc's an hour, when would it finish? That's basically what they're asking. Okay, so we're solving for hours. OK. 
Okay, so I have this right here, right? I have 50 cc's an hour, but I can't plug it in like that over here. I have to put the hour on top and the 50 cc's. So remember I was telling you, you can flip these around based on how you need to use them. So I could have one hour here and 50 cc's here, okay? Now I look into my problem to see, do I have anything else that has cc's? I have here a thousand cc's over one. And then you can cross that out. Then you end up with a thousand over 50. And if you like to do my little zero trick, you can cancel that out. And then you end up with what? Let's see, 100 divided, I think it's 20, but I don't like to do math in my head because I'm always wrong but it'd take 20 hours. So if I was a nurse, right, and I was coming on to shift and I was taking this assignment and I started it at 1700, I'd wanna tell the next nurse that it'll probably be done. You would add 20 hours to this so that you would the nurse would anticipate when it's gonna be done and the bag won't be empty. The patient won't be getting air inside of them. So they can come back and check it. Okay, any questions? So um, you would put actually when it started or when it's going to end? I would tell the nurse when it's going to end. I was just I was just writing this down. So let's say yeah. you started it at 1700, then you would know you'd have to add the 20 hours to figure out when it's going to finish. Because usually we work eight or 12 hour shifts. So it may not finish on our shift. So that way we want to let the next nurse know, hey, just so you know, I started this at this time. It's running at this rate. It's supposed to finish at such and such a time. Okay. Okay, so now we have a patient that's receiving a continuous infusion of medication. It's infusing at 1,440 cc's per day. What is the rate of infusion per minute? So this tells me already that I'm solving for mLs per minute because we're talking about rate. It's how much volume the patient's getting per uh, whatever they're asking, whether it's minute, hour, day. Okay, so we're solving for, didn't want that. We're solving for mLs per minute. Um, the only information I have, or just so you know, remember if it says cc's, one cc is equal to one mL, so you can just convert it over. We don't really use cc's um, in the medical field anymore. It's, they, it's usually mLs, unless you're talking to and no offense to any people that are older than me, but if you're talking to older nurses, they may use the term CC, but we don't use that anymore. Okay, so uh, 1,440 ml, which is the same as CCs per day, okay? But I can't get today. Now, if I wanted to, I could try to memorize, you know, that there's 1,440 minutes in a day, but I'm not going to memorize that because I'm old and my brain has reached its saturation point. Besides, I, I know other conversions that can get me there. So I know that this is going to be a day and then this can be 24 hours because I know there's 24 hours a day. And then I also know that in one hour, there's 60 minutes. So if you don't want to memorize all of that, then just stick with the information you know. Um, so you can cancel this out this way. Multiply across 1,440. And if you multiply 24 times 60, it's 1,440. And then you end up with one ml per minute. Now, if you wanted to do it the other way, because you're like, I don't like that way, Melissa. I, I want to memorize that it's 1,440 minutes then you can say that in one day, there's 1,440 minutes, and you're still gonna get the same answer. So find how your little heart likes to do it and stick with it. 
find what works for with you and stick with it. When I was in nursing school, I remember sticking my fingers in my ears and closing my eyes because sometimes a teacher would talk and try to show other ways and then she'd start talking about doing it other ways and then pretty soon I was like anxious and I couldn't remember how to do it. Okay. Okay, so now we have an infusion that's going at, ooh, 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 wrong pen. Okay, so 1.2 mLs per minute, and the medication will be infused in eight hours. So basically we're trying to figure out how much of the medication is the patient gonna get if it's set at this rate on the pump and it runs for eight hours. So we're solving for mLs because the infusion or the medication is liquid. So I know it's gonna be in mLs. Okay, so I remember I have to keep this together. So 1.2 mLs per minute. Um, 1.2 mLs per minute. And then there's 60 minutes in one hour, and then it's gonna go for eight hours. So this right here is just a conversion to go from minutes to hours so that I can use this information right here. Okay, so now I can multiply all of this across. So 1.2 times 60 times eight, Sorry, my calculator got stuck. Okay, 576 mLs. So if the pump is running at 1.2 mLs per minute, so every minute the patient's getting 1.2 mLs, and it did that for eight hours, the total amount my patient would get is 576 mLs. And then if you still need to, me to cancel these out, that's what you do. And I always usually check, too, to make sure that whatever units are on this side are the same on this side of the equal sign, because then that tells me I set my problem up correctly. Because if it's not the same, then that means I may have mixed up or I didn't set my, uh, uh, my conversions up correctly. Okay, any other questions? All right, well then I'm probably going to release you. I release you, no, I don't mean to sound that way, sorry. I'm gonna let you go <laughs> so you guys can study if you want. <laughs> Any questions before I let you go? I, I have one question, Melissa. Uh -huh. um, earlier um, in our lecture today, you mentioned something about if we get a problem wrong on our math and we resubmit it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I submitted one. It was like a, it was after it had already been graded and sent back. Is that what you're saying? It's okay to do? Mm -hmm. And then just make sure you email me because okay. I won't know to go back and look. Okay. Yeah. So okay, just I'll, I'll email email me so I know to go back and look at the um, math assignment. And if I haven't done it, you might need to email me again. I will. I haven't. I didn't email you, and I just resubmitted it. I actually did it without even knowing. I just it was a typo. Um, oh. but I'll, I'll email you about it. Yeah, because my emails, I'm getting so many emails sometimes that things get lost. Like I'm putting out fires like as they come and then things get pushed down. And so if you've emailed me and I haven't done it yet, I apologize if you don't mind shooting me an email. Because my goal is when I hang up with you today is to try to get that grading ca caught up so you guys aren't stressed. <laughs> I'd be stressed too. And then you'll know kind of where you're at and then we can, if you need to talk to me about your grade or anything, then you'll have all that. So, so should I wait to emailing you until everything's done or still email you just in case? I would, I would wait until you're done. So that way I know that it's ready to go back and check it. But okay. usually I give you like the next class period to fix it. So don't wait too long. You know what I mean? In between. So... I have a question. Uh huh. So I also had uh, one math um, assignment that I was graded. I think I missed a point because of a problem. Uh -huh. But 
I was asked to resubmit it and then, but she still gave me the four points. Would I be able to still get the five points if I, if I email you or? Yeah, if you email me and I see that you redid it, I usually do give you the full credit for it. Because it's, so it's not reflecting that yet. So maybe I'll just yeah. and let you yeah, know. Yeah, email me and then I'll check it and then I can okay. fix it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And it might've been an oversight on my part. Oh, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, now that you mentioned it, I, I wasn't sure I should even bring it up, but I'll, I'll go ahead and email you. Okay, yeah, sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Juliet. You're welcome. All right, any other questions? And that's only for um, the math section, right? Nope, it's also post-discussion. If you didn't score very well in your post-discussion, I'll give you the opportunity to correct that too. But like I said, I usually only give you till the next class period, but I'll give you a little bit of time right now because most people weren't aware. I thought I had told people that like at the beginning when we did our um, first orientation, but uh, if you can get it to me by next week, you know, then I can fix your grades. You're welcome, Brandy. Have a good day. I have a question. Where, uh -huh. can, where can I find the um, uh, review of lecture six practice questions? For the math? No, for the practice questions in like the... Um, um, I can actually go oh. over them with you right now. I can pull it up and go over it with you. I think Shai went over them during... She was going to go over them during the live lecture. She didn't? No. Okay, I can go over them, right, I can go over them with you right now if you want to... Do you have time to hang out for a second? I do. And also, okay. did you... See on lecture six questions today. Is that what those that you ran through them really? The math problems? Lecture seven? No. Yeah, lecture seven. Yeah. You went over the question. You went over you went over the practice questions already for lecture seven. Yeah, we were doing it while we were going through the lecture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did, did you get them? Did yes. you happen to okay. All right, let me um let me pull my binder out really quick so I can find the problem, the um, lecture materials so I can go over those with you. Um, does anyone else have any questions too before um, I do that? Because I don't want you guys to have to wait. All right. You guys can hang out too. Like if you want the answers, you're welcome to hang out too. There was a lot of questions in uh, lecture six. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me just, um, I'm going to stop recording right now just because people may not want to watch this later. Hold on.